planning is critical for the future. On one side of the coin, you can look in Scripture and, and, you know, our life is but a vapor, so don't make a lot of plans. On the other side of the coin, there, is, there was a plan that was set into place long before let there be light. So how do we... We live for Jesus right now, but at the same time, make plans or think about future. Why? Because... None know when Jesus is going to come back. We, we don't know. So if we knew when he was coming back, then we would plan to that end. But we don't know when he's coming back. So we continue to plan. We continue to think forward. How do we, how do we live a gospel-shaped life? How do we present the gospel? How do we play out all of those realities? How do we do that? How do we... How do we build the body and reach the community? How, how do we do those things? And all of these things take planning. There's nothing wrong with planning. We still have to realize that we never know when Jesus is coming back, which really should heighten our sense of urgency to, to plan and to think and to prepare and to, to live out the realities of our life. When you think about our church... How many of you? How many of you in the room are 65 or older? Thank you. There's a lot. There, you know, there's several. It's no secret. We we currently are uh, an older style congregation as far as age goes. We're that's just who God. That's who we have right now, right? But the question comes. What happens when you're not here? Well, I'm going to live to 100. Praise God. We'll take your attendance and your tithe for the next 35 years. That's awesome. But the reality is that in 15 to 20 years, many will not be here. And a plan has to be put into place for us to consider those realities. If Jesus should tarry, if he should not come for many more years, successive generations, what then? And we, we all, well, you know, God built his church, he's going to sustain his church. That, absolutely. God can do whatever he wants to do. Let's just get that out there right now. He can do whatever he wants to do, however he chooses to do it. But experience tells us, and so does the Bible, that quite often he utilizes us to accomplish these tasks. And so we have to be considering what do we do if, what do we do when, because the reality says if Jesus tarries, it's not a if the 65 and up will not be here in 20 to 30 years. It's a when. When is that going to happen? Are we prepared for that? And so this series deals with that sense of planning. There's three parts to this series. The first part is the together as one. Together as one. That we would be one in unity with God, and we'll talk about that next time. But we have to be unified in God. We have to come to a place where we are one with God because of the gospel and our faith response to the gospel message concerning Jesus Christ. We have to be one, but the Bible also has called us to be one. Psalm 133, one says how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in harmony, in unity, in fellowship. So we have to come together as one, but we also come together as many as well. I wonder what do you mean by that? I thought we were one. We are one, but look around. Nobody looks like you, right? I mean, unless you have a twin here. There's a lot of differences among us, and there's, there's vastly more differences out in our community. If we reach our community where we have been planted for 125 years, if we reach the community that's here, we'll look different, and yet we're still called to come together. Now, we can come together diversely. We can also have a diversity of gifts and strengths and abilities. There's some things that some of you do extraordinarily well. 
There are things that some of you do well, others don't, and then you can flip that, and there's some things that others do well that you don't. So we come together and we learn how to operate together, and that'll be the the middle portion of this series. And at the end, we come together as as a community, that we learn to be family together, that we learn how to, to love one another more than maybe we have, or we come together as, as a community of faith and a community of believers. All of this is in light of the gospel that has been given to us that is to be shaping our everyday lives together. Think about our country right now. Have you considered what would happen if we wake up tomorrow and there is no more oil? What do you do? I'm not talking about the cooking oil, by the way. I mean, if we don't don't have oil, how many of you lived through the oil shortages back in the 70s? You know, Uh, man, it was crazy time, wasn't it? There may be a day coming that that happens again. What what do we do? What would happen to our country if, if China were to call us on the debt that we owe them? We'd be more bankrupt than we are now. Because if we don't make a plan for a time when the resources that have, be, have given us the security of today, and if we don't make a plan for looking at securing those resources in the future, then what happens when that is all gone? In the movie The Lorax, if any of you have watched that movie, There is an individual called the Onceler, and he has come upon an opportunity to make a lot of money and to become a person of great importance and great influence, but it comes at a cost because he's burning up all of the resources. And in this clip you're about to watch is a moment when he is being given some advice about what to consider, and yet he doesn't want to consider anything different than what he has come uh, to know currently. So let's watch this together. So how are things? What are you doing here? Happy yet? You fill that hole deep down inside you? Or do you still need more? Look, if you've got a problem with what I'm doing, why haven't you used your quote-unquote powers to stop me? I told you. That's not how it works. Right, I forgot. You're a fraud. I need you to get out. Now! Why? Do I make you uncomfortable? Remind you of the promises you made? The man you used to be? You know what? You can just shut your mustache. My conscience is clear. I have done nothing illegal. I have my rights, and I intend to keep on biggering and biggering and turning more trepulatories into thieves. And nothing is going to stop me. one. That may stop you. All the resources that he had used were now gone. And he hadn't made a plan for what happens if that happens. Advice had been given to him by the individual, but he didn't want to hear that. He, was, he, he liked what he was doing, and he was going to continue to do what he was doing. 
but it came at a cost because now he had no more resources from which to pull. And the church, not just this church, lots of churches are dealing with the same kind of situation. Not immediately. We're fine right now. But what happens when? What happens if? And these are some of the things that we have to consider. and We have to look at the, the plan and uh, involve ourselves in a sense of planning. So I invite you to turn with me over to Luke chapter 14. It'll be a familiar passage. Uh, as it's the same passage that we were uh, introduced to two weeks ago. Uh, and uh, it was kind of funny, actually, when, when uh, on January 2nd, when uh, Robert uh, shared with us, and he opened up that passage, and I'd forgotten that that was the passage he said he, he was going to preach on. And I opened it up, I'm like, well, that should get interesting right quick. So, uh, and, and, and so uh, this message was planned long ago, so don't think that it's in competition with or anything like that. Uh, but I do take a different approach to it, so hey, that, we all grow together, right? I loved what he shared with us the day that, uh, that he shared, and, uh, and amen. I mean, we, we enjoyed what, what he had to share, and I appreciated uh, what he had to share. But I, I want to look at this uh, just uh, from, from this aspect of, of counting the cost, and and being prepared for what is to come. Now, in, in this chapter, we, we find the crowds have been following Jesus. And it says in verse 25, Now, great crowds were traveling with him. So he turned and he began to talk with them. Now, these crowds have, have been with him, and he's been sharing several things with them. You know, have you, have you broken with your past? Have you dealt with these kinds of issues uh, in your own life? Do you have a divided heart? Are you prepared to make a choice? And, he, and he's continuing this kind of conversation with them. And so the whole context of what we're talking about is what does it cost to follow Jesus? But it also involves, are you prepared to make that payment to follow Jesus. Now, there is a, a personal application that is going to be made to this. There's also a corporate or church application that we as a body of believers have choices that we make every time we gather together. We make choices all the time, whether it is in committee meetings or whether it is in church conferences or whether it is in other gatherings of our church. We, we make decisions on many kinds of things. And so Jesus is wanting us to be prepared in both areas, personally and corporately. So when I use corporately, I'm talking about the church. I know it can get confusing sometimes. Are you talking about the local church or the big C church? And so I try to make those clear when I'm talking about the big C church. But often today and, and the next several weeks, I'll be talking about personal application and our local church application to that. So, let's look and see what he has to say to us. Verse 26, if anyone comes to me and doesn't hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever doesn't bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Does anybody else find that hard to swallow? I mean... There, there are times that Jesus makes statements that are just, there's difficult. He's raising the bar higher than we've ever raised the bar. He's saying that, you know what, you cannot be a Christian and nominally. You can't just do it in name only. You're all in or you're not in at all. He said, you've got to count the cost. You've got to be ready to do this. And so he lays out an illustration that talks about something that they would all be very familiar with, the family structure. And he says, look, if you don't if if your love for me doesn't make it appear that you hate your family, you don't love me enough. You haven't counted that complete cost. Now, there are some things culturally we don't deal with that they were dealing with at the time. If you claimed Christ, you very well could lose your whole family because they may not claim Christ. 
They may not love Christ. And if you're trying to play both ends of that game, well, I want to love Jesus, but I don't want to lose my family in the process. And Jesus is saying, it is time to start making some decisions. It doesn't mean that he's going to remove our family. And it doesn't mean that, that we, we have to literally hate our family. But he's just saying, look, this is the setup. This is what you have to consider. If you were to compare that, do you love me? And it comes in a variety of ways, and I understand that. But do you love me? This is, he said, you, you've got to take this into consideration, and you have to count this cost. Why does he want us to consider these things? I would likely say because above many other things, the family can be such a temptation for us. It can be such a, a difficulty at times for us. Because, I mean, this is flesh and blood. This is, this is right here, and, and it's easy for us, all of us, me included. It, it's so easy for us to, to look at the flesh and blood and, and, and love them as we are called to love them as our family. And sometimes it's easy to defer to what I see instead of to who I don't see right now. I don't see Jesus. I don't see him in the same way I see uh, my family. I don't see him in the same way. We don't. We don't see him physically. That's a spiritual moment. And we have to, we have to reckon with that and we have to deal with that and, and, and consider that. Do, am I allowing my family to overtake my desires for God? Am I allowing my family to overwhelm in that way? Am I, what am I doing? Do I love Jesus enough? Those are hard questions. You know what? And I think if we were all real honest, we'd say, some days I do and some days I don't. How, how do I reckon with that? How do we balance that? How do we deal with that? Jesus is wanting us to examine our own hearts and examine our lives about these things. This is, it's true in the church, too. We, we have to be aware. Am I, what am I in love with? Do, do I... Am I, am I following God or am I following a religion about God? Am I following what Scripture tells me to do or am I following what I've just always done and hope it's right? These, these are just hard questions, but they're questions that we all have to ask. We all have to deal with in our own lives. There's an isolation that can come uh, as a result of that, and are, are we ready for that? You know, in verse 27, that such a paradox happens. Whoever doesn't bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Here's the paradox. You have to die to live. You have to die to live. Crucifixion to resurrection. He had to die to come back to life. And he calls us to, bear, to take up your cross, to, to bear your own cross. Are you ready to do that? Because he says, if you're not prepared to die to yourself, you cannot be my disciple. Well, what does it mean to die to myself? Well, it means that I, I need to put the needs of Christ ahead of my own. I need to, to do what he wants me to do regardless of the cost that it, it might make. Rarely have we had to consider in this country, if I choose Christ, then I lose my family. Am I willing to do that? If I choose Christ, I'm going to hurt my family. We haven't had to make those kinds of distinctions. I think a time is coming when we might have to. And that's not, that's not a fun thing to consider. But we have to take into consideration these kinds of things. Why? Because to follow Christ is a lifelong commitment. It's a lifelong commitment. It's not that I gave my life to Jesus back on this day. Whew, man, glad I got that handled. And not have it understand that you couldn't save yourself. You're not going to keep yourself either. You've got to fall underneath what does Jesus want me to do? Spirit of God, what do you want me to do today? And he, he, he shares that message so clearly so often in his word back to us. If we are reading his word and studying his word and being in his word and letting it shape us and lead us and guide us in the things that we think, say, and do. 
And we're not going to be perfect at that. I'm not. We're not. But are we striving to do the things that God wants us to do? Are we striving to do the things that the Bible tells us to do? Because it's a lifelong commitment. And maybe when you came to Christ, nobody told you that. Maybe all they told you was, hey, just pray this prayer and you're going to be good. I'm sorry to have to break it to you, but it's not a one-time thing. The release of your sin guilt before God happened one time, and I understand that, and and we're going to believe that, that it happens at the salvation moment. It happens right, but your commitment to Christ didn't just end at that moment. It wasn't, hey, hey, thanks, see you later. it's It's a lifelong commitment. And if that radical change in your life on whatever day it was in your life isn't also continuing to shape how you think and live and behave today, we've we've lost sight of what the gospel message really is. That it is a one-time effect and it's also an ongoing effect. Paul would later say in the New Testament that I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. There's three aspects to that. I was released of my sin guilt, and now I have a life of commitment to Jesus that I need to give him my everything, and then there will come a time when I get to go and be with him in heaven. I was saved, I am being saved, I will be saved. But in in our language, we confuse those things. Oh, well, no. It's a one-time event to release your sin guilt, and the question is, have you done that? But sometimes and this was very prevalent during my growing up years, that it was shortcut, and it was made simple. It was made incomplete. A friend of mine, his, his, uh, one of his family members, they were going to church. And the preacher said, hey, if you love Jesus, uh, raise your hand. I love Jesus, sure. And he pronounced salvation over that individual because they simply raised their hand to say, I love Jesus. That's not the gospel. Hey, just pray this prayer. Well, is there any sincerity to it? Is there any lifelong understanding of commitment that I'm giving my life to God? My wife for years, as she has taught kindergarten for so many years, uses this terminology uh, for God to be my boss. You know, little kids understand what a boss is. You know, in an in adult world, we, we talk about, hey, God, lead me. You, you be the leader of my life. But sometimes I think it's good for us to say, God, I want you to be my boss. I need you to, I need you to boss me around. And we don't always like that. But that's the gospel. The gospel is, look what God did and what's my faith response to that, that I will stop trying to figure it out on my own and accept what it is that God has given me. But I have to understand that it is when I make that commitment, it's a life commitment. I, I need to realize that I, I give my life to God and I, I've turned my life over to Him so that He could be the one in charge of it all. I think so often we love the effects of, whether emotional or spiritual, of that moment when my sin guilt was released and removed from me because of my faith decision in Jesus Christ. But then we want to have all of the decision making back on us. And that gets us into a lot of trouble. Because God and His Word and the guidance of His Spirit are to be, are to be the ones guiding us in the decisions and the, and the processes and, and the things of that nature. I, with you, can probably attest to several times in our lives when we made decisions based on ourselves and we we had to reap the benefits of that compared to when we made decisions that God led us to. Those benefits are radically different. They're altering our lives. We We have to count that cost. Down in verse 28 through 32, We need to choose carefully. It says, For which of you, wanting to build a tower, doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, after he's laid the foundation and can't finish it, all the onlookers will begin to ridicule him, saying, Well, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Or what king, going to war against another king, will not first sit down 
and decide if he's able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who doesn't renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. So, not only do we need to count the cost in verses 26 and 27, but here in these next set of verses, we need to choose carefully moving forward. We, we have to choose carefully. This, I, this, you know, which of you, in verse 28, which of you, and the implication is there also in verse 31. Hey, you know, which of you, and it's, it's, it's a question asked with a negative response. Well, none of us, no, no, nobody's going to do that. Who is going to go out to build a house and not have figured out how much it's going to cost? Well, n- nobody's going to do that. Or who, who, what king's going to go to war if they don't already know what's going to happen? They don't do that. They're going to calculate. They're going to decide. They're, they're going to make some choices, and they're going to choose it very carefully in, in their life. They're going to sit down. They're going to calculate. That term is used in a couple of places. They're going to decide, and then they're going to act. We, we do the same thing, and we should be doing the same thing. You pause. You've got a decision to make. You pause. I've, I've told my kids, and I tell everybody else, If somebody is demanding an immediate decision out of you and refuses to allow you time to pause and pray about it, you probably don't need to be doing whatever it is they want you to do. Well, but well, it's an emergency situation. Well, there's a moral and an ethic that's there to help and guide you in that. But you know, there's a lot of times people want an immediate decision and you need time to pause and reflect on that sometimes. And In our lives and in our church, we need time to pause and and to pray about things. We do. We need to to plan some things. And we need to prepare for the outcomes that are coming. And then we proceed with it. This happens all the time. Maybe it doesn't happen often enough. But we need to be adopting individually, corporately, this concept of pause and pray. Pause and pray. So that we can continue to move forward in the way that God wants us to go. There are some decisions that are outside of ourselves. There are some decisions that are beyond ourselves. There are some decisions that we think we can make, but we shouldn't. We need to be pausing and praying before God and seeking His guidance in these things. And then we begin, then we plan and we move forward and we, we act on those things. And this is what Jesus is wanting us to do. What happens if not? Well, the owner is ridiculed. The owner is ridiculed. The workers aren't ridiculed, the owner is ridiculed. You know, there was a time in the desert where God was going to destroy everybody and said, Moses, I'll start over with you. And Moses said, no, 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 no. What happens if you do that? If we do that, and it's not that God didn't know that. Don't read in what isn't there. It's not that God didn't know that. He's wanting to shape and organize and help Moses grow in his leadership. Because Moses is like, look, you're not going to receive glory. In fact, you're going to receive ridicule if that happens from all these other nations that we're trying to be a light to. The same is true for us. We have to be ready and to prepare and to plan ahead. Because if we don't make a plan, if we don't look ahead and say, what happens when this goes on and how do we backtrack and how do we backfill into this and how do we prepare these things? If we don't do that, it's not us that gets the ridicule. It's God who does. It's the owner. And we have to be careful that he gets the glory he's supposed to be getting. And we must maintain that level of God getting the glory for the things that He is doing. 
Sure, he uses us. And yes, we, we recognize and we, we applaud others in their faithful stewardship of their lives to serve God. And we applaud that and we are thankful for that. But ultimately, we, we go higher and we, we praise God for that. We, we give him the glory ultimately for all of these things. And so we create a plan. Verse 27 and 33. Whoever doesn't bear his own cross and come after me can't be my disciple. And verse 33, in the same way, therefore every one of you who doesn't renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciple. What does that look like to bear your cross so others can see Jesus? Well, serving others instead of serving self. That, that's a critical component. And we must continue to do that. Continue to move forward in that capacity that we are serving God and we are serving others. Not, not just what we want. I mean, we all have our creature comforts. Every one of us do. We all have our creature comforts. And sometimes, many times, God calls us out of those creature comforts into a different space and place. And it ain't easy. Right? Right? We don't like it. We don't like moving to different places. Trust me, three out of the last four summers I've had to physically move. Not a fan. Not a fan. I got a note the other day uh, from our leasing agent saying, hey, uh, the renewal's coming up. I'm like, wherever I can sign on that dotted line, bub, I want to do it right now. Because if that means that I get, I, I don't have to do it, I'm all about it. I hate it. I don't like it. I mean, Sometimes you just have to. Sometimes you got to pack it all up and you got to move it. And in that packing up, sometimes, sometimes things fall off the truck. Anyway, I'm just going to say the blessed, redu blessed subtraction of moving. But anyway, you know, we, there's some times that there's some things that don't make it from one house to the next. Because in that process, things have changed. The house you're going to isn't the house you had. We had one time, it was, it was awesome. It was the easiest move apart from actual packing and getting stuff from one place to another. It was the easiest move. We had a, we had a manufactured home and it, we were moving it from one, from one place to another place. And literally, we could just write the name of the, of the room on that box. Because it was going back to the same exact room. It was a beautiful moment, let me just tell you. It was awesome. But when we moved from that place to another house, we had some similar rooms, but they weren't the same rooms. And so we had to readjust and move things around. And some houses, I, I'm just telling you, some architects, I, I, I just don't believe, need to be in business. The way that they've structured some houses, it just, it, to me, I'm sure it makes absolute complete sense to them. I don't see it. It's like, why did you put a wall here? I don't understand that. And maybe it's a load-bearing wall. Maybe it's a HUD requirement. I, I get that. I understand the engineering of it all. But it's just like, okay, that's only three feet from this other wall. Why do I need that one here? I don't, I don't know. I'm sure there's reasons. And somebody who's an architect, Clayton, you probably help me understand. <laughs> why does that wall have to be right there? I don't know. But it is. Well, why is this room 14 times larger than that room? I don't understand that. And it's upstairs. Why? I don't know. Why is it that way? So we had to plan. You had to be prepared. If we're going to move from this house to that house, one, we need to know the layout of what we have. We need to know the stuff. I hesitate to say junk. The stuff that we have and the house we're going to. And you have to understand, okay, this house is not the house we're leaving. And all of this stuff has to go someplace. So is it, is it all going? Is it mostly going? Is, are we now going to have to have a storage unit? Or can we, can we put it out on the side of the road? What are we doing? I'm a minimalist. I live with a maximalist. I love her. Don't read into anything there. But if we ever have differences of opinion, 
we ever have arguments, and yes, the pastor's family have fights and arguments too, just to let you know. We're humans too. And a minimalist and a maximalist sometimes don't see things the same. We have to make a plan. What are we going to do? Is it all going to fit? And if it's not, then what? Just a personal story. Many of you know that her mother died last March. And her dad is struggling, but he, he's okay. Um, but we already realized there's going to come a time when all of that is going to have to be dealt with. Honey, where's all that going? Well, I, I, I really want this. This is sentimental to me. I really want I, that's That's awesome. And I made the statement, I don't know if it's going to hold or not. You know, that's great, but where's it all going to go? Is there, can we make a trade one for one? Bring one thing in, one thing goes out. And see, I got all the guys going, yeah, baby, let's do it that way. And all the ladies are going, now wait a minute. Let's talk about this. It's human life, right? Guys are like, throw it in a barn. Ladies are like, it doesn't go in a barn. I'm like, okay. Okay. Watch this. We as a church, moving forward in the 21st century, may not look like it used to look, may not have all the rooms that it used to have. And so we want to move all of our stuff from here to here. And sometimes we want to take some other stuff over here and try to throw it all in here. And the problem is it doesn't all fit, so now we have choices to make. What are we going to do? How are we going to make all of this work? And just adding more spiritual connex buildings out in the back 40 isn't going to cut it. We can't just throw all of it in there. We're going to have to make choices moving forward. And that's a part of this process is, is doing that. It's no small thing to follow Jesus. What's the plan? Personally, do you have... Do you have a plan? Do you have a life plan? Do you have an afterlife plan? See, this is what the gospel provides for you personally, is an afterlife plan. Here's the thing, though. The gospel, once you accept the gospel into your own life, becomes a new life plan for you also. And so we, we ask ourselves, and I ask you, have you come to terms and grips with the gospel of Jesus Christ? That we as human beings have sinned and broken our relationship with God. Maybe unintentionally, but nonetheless we've done it. And that cannot be paid back by anything that we try to do. There are not enough righteous acts to make me right with God apart from Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven by which a man may be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. I cannot come to God and say, but you know, I did good things. I lived a good life. And he goes, no, you didn't. You were like filthy rags to me that I'm going to toss out to the side. But wait a minute, that hurts my feelings. God's like, I gave you, here it is. What are you going to do with it? That's Jesus. He gave us Jesus. He gave us the pathway. He gave us the opportunity. He gave us a new life in Jesus. Should we accept it? God, I have done wrong that I can't pay back. I believe and I trust that Jesus Christ paid the debt that I owe you. And I, I'm going to lower my pride and say, God, I accept the payment in Jesus Christ over my life. Would you now be the boss of my life? Would you forgive me of all that I've done in, because of Jesus, and would you be the leader? Would you guide me and direct me? And the Bible goes a step further and says, will you now own me? Your life is not your own, but it's been bought with a price. 
And yes, I understand the adoptive language of coming into the family of God, but I also know the slave language that the Bible talks about that we don't like to talk about in 2022. It's there. I'm owned by God. He is to be my master. Not in a fearful way, but nonetheless, He's the one that's supposed to be in charge of me, in charge of you, in charge of us. Do you have that? Have you made that decision? Because if you haven't made that decision, that's your first decision to make. But even corporately, we have, we have decisions to make in our own life. We have, we have to ask ourselves, here's the tough question, guys. Am I okay if the church doesn't exist in 30 years as long as it was there for my own funeral? Am I satisfied with that? Am I really satisfied with that? I'm not. I don't think that's the plan of God for any church. It is the ministry of the church, but it is not the plan of the church. And we have to begin to ask ourselves, am I willing to do that? Am I willing to to see what God wants me to do. Just like moving houses. There's a whole lot of similarities. They all have bedrooms and bathrooms and living rooms and kitchens. Most have garages. So much similarity. But sometimes you got to redo the layout and rethink the layout and rethink how things are going to fit here. It's not that I don't live in a house. It's not like we move from a house to a tent. I moved from a house to a house. And yet, there were some uncomfortable changes that had to be made, had to be made in order to accommodate where we are living now. Are we ready to do that? That's, that's what God wants us to understand. The bulk of what we talk about is not changing. The Bible doesn't change. It's not going to change. As long as I'm your pastor, we will preach the Word of God. The question is, are we going to follow the Word of God? See, we as Baptists are big on, oh, it's the sufficiency of Scripture. Oh, it's all sufficient. It's inerrant. It's infallible. Just don't talk to me about how I need to change something in my own life. Well, is, is it or is it not? Well, that's just your interpretation. It's fair. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. But we have to begin asking ourselves these questions. What, what, what do we do with all this? And there's three things that you can do right now. Here's the first thing that we, as a body of Christ, must come together and do. One, we have to pray. And some of you, in the moments ahead, as uh, the musicians come and make their way up in just a moment, some of you need to take that time and pray. You, you've already made these decisions, you're already on board, you're ready to go, and you just need to be praying for our body and praying for the Spirit of God to have His complete control over our place. And we need to be praying that we would humble ourselves before a holy God and say, whatever you want, that's what we're going to do so that we can see the lost come to salvation. I am tired of bringing people from other churches to this church while the lost are going to hell in our own community. We've got to move beyond transfer growth and get over to conversion growth. I've seen the lost come to Jesus. We've got to pray. Secondly, we have to obey. And maybe some of us in this room are not, or online, wherever you may be, maybe there, there are sins in your own life that you need to be confessing before God. Maybe the level of obedience has not been there to the degree you know it should have been. Oh, so you're saying I should be perfect? No. But what I'm saying is, if you're a 5 out of 10, what's it going to take to get to 6? What do you need to confess before God to, get move, to move forward and to move that needle toward more sanctification than it has been? There are, there are things in our own lives that we're going to have to lay on the altar before, before God. I'm, am I willing to bear my cross and move forward with Him? There is confession that needs to happen. 
And I would suggest that there is always a sense of private confession that needs to be made before God. There's something that we need to get right with God about. And there's also times where we need to be uh, relationally confessing and getting right with somebody else. And there might even be, and this is days gone by of how things were done for centuries, there might also come a time where we need to have public confession and say, you know what, I have sinned against the body. And I seek forgiveness. Not for pride and not for gossip, but just so that we as a body of Christ can be right with a holy God. And the third thing we can do is don't stray. Stay faithful. So you may be here today or online and you need to take a moment during this time of singing. You need to pray. Maybe you need to take time and confess. Or maybe you need to ask God to help you stay faithful in the process. Pray, obey, don't stray. What is the Spirit of God wanting to tweak in your own life right now?